Welcome to Bits About Books, the home for conversations with authors of breakthrough books on sales, marketing and business. Founders, entrepreneurs and individual professionals, we all need to keep track of ideas that are helping create our today and tomorrow. Bits About Books will strive to find those books and speak to their authors, go behind the scenes and understand what inspired the authors to write the books that they did and how they went about doing so. Through our conversations, we hope to gain insights that will help us to get the most out of our efforts. I'm your host Shubhanjan Sarkar, founder of Pitchlink, the next generation buyer-seller engagement platform where our mission is to make buying easy. Welcome to Bits About Books. Thank you for your time and for joining us in this session. I have a favor to ask. While you continue to listen to the podcast, please leave a comment or rating at iTunes or wherever else you get your podcasts from. I personally look at each comment and will give you a shout out to each of you in our following episodes. It means a lot to hear from you. Our guests today are Richard Fenton and Andrea Walls and we speak with them about their latest bestseller, When They Say No, a follow-up to their international bestseller, Go For No. Go For No is based on the idea that if you ask great questions and you listen to the answers, you understand a prospect's wants or needs, and then you've come to the conclusion that the product or service that you have to offer meets them, then you should truly, truly go for no. You should truly be persistent because what you're selling is in the customer's best interest. And that's the difference between, you know, go for no and a lot of other sales books that, you know, will come out and say, like, here's the puppy dog clothes, you know, make sure that, you know, the person takes the item home and, and then they can return it after two days if they don't like it. We don't want to do any of those manipulative nonsense items. We want to get as close to possible as, as being able to live what we call to sell is to serve. Richard Fenton and Andrea Walls are the founders of Courage Crafters Incorporated and the authors of the best-selling book, Go For No. They speak internationally, teaching business, sales, and entrepreneurial audiences how to overcome their fear of rejection and achieve extraordinary sales success by hearing no more often. Richard and Andrea are also producers of a 98-minute personal development DVD movie and their Go For No philosophies have been featured in hundreds of online and offline publications, including Inc. Magazine, Forbes, Success Magazine, and many more. The book Go For No reached number one on Amazon's selling list of 2010. The book has remained in the top 50 sales books for the last 12 years and has become a well-known methodology in the world of selling, widely recognized as the singular best program for dealing with rejection in business. In 2023, they released this follow-up book to their original, When They Say No, designed to give readers strategies for what to think, say and do when they get rejected in sales. Yes, Richard and Andrea are also married. They live in Florida with their cat Story, their dog Peppers and an alligator in the pond behind their house named Gary. Secret fact, Richard is also a fiction writer and the author of a 11-book paranormal thriller series under a pen name. Now, on to this exciting new episode with Richard Fenton and Andrea Watts. Andrea, Richard, welcome to Bits About Books. I'm so, so glad and so happy that both of you could join us and talk about your new book. Andrea, we spoke about your previous book and that was uh, very well received, as you know. And I'm, I'm really thrilled that I could get both of you on this one. Thank you very much. Yes, our pleasure. Yeah, great to be here. Thank you. Would you like to tell a little about the work you are doing currently? Yeah, uh, I will start. So we uh, are primarily speakers and we focus on one specific message. So a lot of speakers, they talk on broad topics, leadership, sales, different things. We focus specifically on people, mostly in sales, B2B, B2C, um, who have to face hearing the word no and on the skill set required to handle that successfully, respond to those no's successfully. And so it's very uh, a very niche subject. We do that through speaking, online courses, and books. So let's talk about this book, because we did speak about the first book, which was written nearly, I mean, it is more than a decade before, right? Oh, yeah. We're at two decades now. Really? Really? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So I must have caught you like towards the end of that uh, that phase. 
uh, and possibly this was on the making at that point of time. I I, I never inquired. I should have, I guess. Uh, but what th- that book was was quite iconic because I think one of the things we discuss a lot when I talk to a lot of lot of sales, uh, you know, practitioners and leaders and so on. Getting a no is still a problem. Yet we convert only two percent of our of our leads that we open. So that that's the B two B number. Okay, I mean we can we can argue whether it's it's one point eight or five or seven, but but it's a low single digit, which means 90, 90 out of hundred times we are getting rejected. Yet we try not to think about it. Right, right. What what according to you? You have spoken to literally hundreds of people trained hundreds of people. Why is it so? Well, as Andrea likes to point out, and quite frankly, I didn't realize this until she um, educated me on it. We are biologically programmed to hate rejection. Mm. You know, when when um, people, you know, hundreds of thousands of years ago, tens of thousands of years ago would be rejected by the tribe, it meant that you were literally rejected. You were you were sent away um, off into the woods to try to uh, you know outrun the wolves and see if you could survive on nuts and berries. Being rejected was a very very bad thing. Mm-hmm. And as much as we can say that, well, wait, we don't live in the in that world anymore. It's not the same thing. You know, being rejected, you're not going to die. Well, try telling that to your brain. When your brain hears no. When it hears that you are being pushed away in any way, shape, or form, it immediately goes into this flight or you know fight or flight mode. It goes into this protectionist mode, and it fundamentally your mind says, "Oh, this isn't good. Run, okay? You run, get away. This is a this is a this is a tiger." Or it says, "Hey, you've got to put up your fists and get ready to fight. Right? We're going to have a fight here." Well. That's the issue. The primary issue is we are programmed at the DNA level to dislike um, and fear rejection. So, you know, it's the very odd, very um, rare, uh, rare, that's the better word, very rare person who has no fear of failure and rejection at all. My father was one of those people, right, who, you know, he was the quintessential sales natural nothing scared him ever he would talk to anybody politicians celebrities you know sports figures didn't matter he could start a conversation with anyone anywhere anytime about anything he is the rarity the most common the 99 out of 100 people um have a problem with trying to start conversations with strangers and when those people look like they are rejecting them our natural tendency is to try to to get away And I think the other piece to that as well is that salespeople by their nature are naturally positive Mm -hmm. and so are sales managers and nobody wants to bring up this elephant in the room. Nobody wants to start the sales meeting by like, okay, let's dig into rejection and let's talk about no. It's like, let's just talk about the tools and let's talk about your CRM and let's talk about all the other things without dealing with a difficult subject because I think... Although rejection can be, it's quantifiable and it's, uh, there's tactical strategies around it. It's also an emotional topic. Mm -hmm. And so sales managers try to stay away from those emotional things. Like maybe we can just talk about numbers and we don't have to get into the emotions. Yeah. I I think it makes so much sense. Uh, Coming back to the current book, two decades, why did you think a new book is required? Um, that is a great question. You want yeah, to take that? I'll take that. Well, okay. So because we have uh, been teaching go for no for so long and teach people get no, be willing to hear no, go for no. And one of the questions that we always got was when I'm getting all these no's, you know, what should I think and what? how should I be responding? And do you have a good like come back that I can say. And so we've known, the truth is we've known for a long time that the next piece of it, that the next logical step is how how to actually tactically deal with that rejection. Mm -hmm. Um, And the, the tricky part for us is that then it starts becoming go for yes. 
Uh, and, and we didn't want to necessarily write a go for yes book, but we, but we knew that there was a gap. And so that's why Richard came up with the brilliant title, When They Say No. And we decided not to categorize every single rejection that you could possibly get. Like, you know, here are the, cause there's, there's hundreds, there's thousands of reasons why people get no and, and what those sound like and look like. But we came up with what we thought were the core, there's 41 of them, core 41 strategies. And they're either, it's either a mindset. Some of them are mindset oriented. Some of them are tactical. And we thought this would be a good, short, powerful, definitive guide to handling those and, and, and giving people the tool that I think they always needed with go for no. It only took us 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you, you basically were gathering two tactics a year, if I, if I go by that calculation. <laughs> That's exactly okay. right. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, so you, 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 you sort of somewhere along the way, you knew that there has to be a follow-up because of the way your, uh, for the lack of a better word, instead of students, I'll say customers, your customers were saying, okay, you, you tell me to embrace no, but what do I do after I embrace it? Okay. So, so that, so I, I, I can understand that they're asking you this question all the time and possibly you are coming up with ideas as you are doing these workshops and you're doing these training sessions and then you started jotting them down. When do you actually get to writing the book and when did you sort of decide that this is going to be the structure? This is how we are going to break it up. Well, the first thing, um, and, and I'm the lead writer, we we make all our decisions together and we do outlines together, but then I'm the one who writes the first draft and Andrea is the one who digs in with the red pen and crosses out like a lot of what I've written, <laughs> which is painful. Um, but, uh, you know, when, when I when I thought we needed this book and I uh, thought, how do we go about writing it? First thing I knew is that it couldn't be a fable like we did with Go For No, because we didn't want the individual nuggets, the individual um, uh, reference points to be buried in a story. Mm -hmm. We wanted people to be able to flip through the table of contents and, um, you know, whether it's the first time going through or whether it's the third or fourth reading of the book, we don't think anybody is going to master everything in this book by reading it one time. Sure. Um, you know, this is this is something that um, if you're going to get good at handling failure and rejection, you're going to have to keep you know, chipping away at it. And we wanted people to be able to say, okay, I'm good at this. I'm good at this. Ooh, this is an area of weakness for me. And we wanted them to very quickly be able to, to go to that area. So we came up with the idea of just making them short one, two, and in a couple of cases, three page um, uh, chapters, if you will, yeah, uh, where people could very quickly get it. And, you know, we, we tried to keep a very casual um, language here. Um, you know, we're, we write the way we speak and we tell a lot of personal stories. So people have frames of reference, but, um, that's pretty much how we came up. Once we had that format, the book, you know, almost wrote itself The you know, the book, the writing was very, very quick, uh, go for no, the original book took us 17 days to write. And this book probably took us about 30 days to write. Is there any reason why you thought that it should be like, like in parts, four parts, or I mean, why it couldn't be one sort of flow? Yeah, how did you come up with that? Yeah, um, <laughs> well, well, first off, we know that there's a lot of people who are going to see this book who have never read Go for No, mm, and right. they needed some fr they needed some frame of reference. So, um, right. you know, the Go for No book, the original, which has sold five hundred thousand copies now. So, you know, we've only got about seven billion more people that we can get to. Um, uh, the, the, the original, the original Go for No was based on a story, based on an event that happened to me. Uh, in my in my sales career when I was selling suits for a living. And without that frame of reference, the rest of the book doesn't really have anything to hang on. Mm. Um, that was the first reason. The second right. reason that we put in the in the beginning of the book, these what we call the four selling styles, is that over the years, there's been a lot of people who when they hear the term go for no, they think it means that you're supposed to that you're supposed to, you know, bludgeon people, that you're supposed to nag after people, right? Um, that is not at all what go for no is about go for no is based on the idea that if you ask great questions and you listen to the answers, you understand a prospect's wants or needs, 
And then you've come to the conclusion that the product or service that you have to offer meets them, then you should truly, truly go for no. You should truly be persistent because what you're selling is in the customer's best interest. And that's the difference between, you know, go for no and a lot of other sales books that, you know, will come out and say, here's the puppy dog clothes, you know, make sure that, you know, the person takes the item home and, and then they can return it after two days if they don't like it. Here's the doorknob clothes that you say, oh, on the way out of the, we don't want to do any of those manipulative nonsense items. We want to get as close to possible as, as being able to live what we call to sell is to serve right? That selling isn't something that you do to people. It's something that you do for people. And we wanted to make sure in the beginning of the book that people understood what Go For No was and that we were coming from the right direction. Then we launched into part two, which are the 41 individual little chapters. And then at the, you know, at the end, we realized, you know, there's a couple of times where in part three, which is, um, you know, when they say yes, a lot of people think that when they get to yes, they're done. Well, you're not. There's always opportunities to go for no, even within a yes. That was something that I that I suffered from in the clothing business. Somebody would come in and want to buy a suit. I'd sell them the suit and I'd send them on their way. I'd get one yes on the suit, but I didn't show the shirts, ties, shoes, socks, belts, underwear. I didn't show the rest of the things they could have bought because I was averse to no. That was also bad customer service. To sell the customer all the things that went with the suit was actually the best service. So I was doing a disservice by not selling it. And at the end, I wrapped up with a couple of stories that are um, motivational to me that remind me that no matter, no matter what, you're always going to need a certain amount of courage to be able to, to, um, to go out and sell. But more, more um, specifically, to go out and sell to somebody who you perceive as higher up on the ladder than you, the quote, big fish. The person right. who you don't feel worthy of selling to. So that's really the structure of the book. And and I just want to add in the other piece of this whole thing. We had to do all of this in ideally under 120 pages because we created a, a publishing company called Success in 100 Pages. So our, our, our goal is to create things. Now, we call this the definitive guide for handling rejection and sales. But still, we wanted the guide to be as short and powerful as possible. So keeping it short was very difficult to not want to go off into tangents. And we could have added so much, but we want our books to be consumable. So that was the other thing is we had to accomplish all of this in about 115 pages. Right. That's that's an interesting point you raise, Andrea, because I, I wanted to tell you this, that I see the book is very short. And I've been having discussions with with authors like you, I'll not name them, uh, who, who, who are guests on my show, that typically you can pick up any sales book. And again, I'm not, no disrespect here. 50% mm -hmm. of it can be removed very easily. Mm -hmm. The, a 300-page book can pretty much be a 150-page book without losing anything. So, so there is this tendency of making a book larger than necessary. Uh, he, this gentleman used the word fluff, uh, but I don't want to do that. But, but I, I, I understand the sentiment and I, and I, I truly appreciate that, you know, keeping it concise. If, if, it, if it required, I'm sure you would have written 10 more pages if it, if it, it, if it had to be written, right? But, right. Oh, but yeah, keeping, it, keeping it there is, is, is a difficult task and it's, it's the job of the author. There's no way the, the reader can figure that out, right? Um, yeah, absolutely. And, and something that we learned very um, early on, uh, you know, I mean, Go For No, the original Go For No book was 80 pages. And it wasn't 80 pages because we we said, keep it to 80 pages or keep it under 100. It We were done in 80 pages. When we got to the 80 page mark, the story was told. We'd hit all the points. There was no reason, as you said, you know, to add fluff. There's a lot of people who write books and publish books, and they they think that they have to price it by the pound. <laughs> right. That if the book is longer and the book is heavier, they can somehow get more money for it. But if you look back at all the great sales books and in particular, you know, in time, and I'll just go um, or not just sales books, but business books, you know, you go back to the one minute manager. I mean, Ken Blanchard pretty much took the lid off the basket as far as short books go. 
And, you know, the publisher, the, the publisher, greatest salesman in the, greatest world. Salesman in the world, Og Mandino, um, you know, the publisher wanted Ken Blanchard to write a longer book. As he said, business books aren't 100 pages. And he said, well, this one is, you know, and what he proved and what we've we've come to understand is consumption is just as important as the size of the book. Yeah. You know, you and many of your listeners right now, you can look over on your bookshelf and you can see three, four, five, 10, maybe 20 or 30 books that are 200, 300 pages or more. And you bought them with good intentions. You bought them two years ago and you still haven't started it. Hmm. Because every time you look at it, you go like, oh, when am I going to have time to, to read all of that? We realize that consumption is central to learning. So we want to write books that people would look at and go, hey, I could finish this on an airplane trip. Yeah. You know, I could finish this tonight before I go to bed. We wanted people to see it as a one or two hour book maximum. And uh, we think that's a big reason why Go For No caught on and why we keep all of our books short. Great. So uh, I, I, th I think we have a good understanding of how this came about. Let's dive into the book. And the first thing I want to, I mean, if you want, I'm, I'm happy if you, if you sort of want to summarize the, 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 the conceptual framework of Go For No. Uh, but what I would like you to tell me is about the four selling styles. I would like you to elaborate a bit on that. Yeah, yeah. So the four selling styles is just a really simple matrix, and it's based on two two concerns that all salespeople have. One is the concern for results, and the other is the concern for relationships. And when you cross-reference these two concerns against each other, you get the four-quadrant matrix. Mm -hmm. So if you take somebody who um, has a low concern for results and a low concern for relationships, we call that person the pretender. They do, they do nothing, <laughs> right? Uh, obviously, they do not succeed in sales. Um, you take somebody who has a high concern for building relationships and having people like them, uh, we call this the friend. So they're great at building relationships, but they're not as good as getting results because the results is it's certainly they would like to get results, but they don't want to have to get them by selling. They would rather get, have the customer take charge and, and create those sales. And so that's that style, the friend, uh, on the flip side you have the person who cares only about results, doesn't care about building relationships. So they're really a short term thinker in terms of their sales career. And uh, we call this person, well, we, we jokingly refer to them as, as the shark, but we call them the adversary. So they're really, it's really the enemy. You know, they, they, they go into uh, battle when it comes to selling, right? It's, it's, it's like a war and they want to win. Yeah. Um, and then the ideal style is obviously the person who cares about both cares about both building that relationship, having people like them, like the company, like the process, and also about getting results and that they don't compromise either one of those. And that's a style that we call the advisor. Okay. And, uh, you know, we wanted to have that framework as Richard alluded to earlier, because we wanted people to understand that when it comes to selling and when it comes to hearing no, uh, you if you are fearful of no, and so you shy away from it, you end up becoming the friend. Mm. If you uh, badger people and you don't care if they tell you no, and you're going to steamroll over them and you're going to do whatever it takes to turn that no into a yes, that turns into that adversarial shark style. So we want to take that no, build upon it, create that value, build upon the connection and eventually turn that into a yes if it's appropriate for that customer, not by force. It's time for a short break. Stay with us. After the break. When they say no, your problem may not be closing. It may be opening. And what I mean by that, of course, if you go to the, you go to the uh, bookstore or go online and look up sales books, you're going to find, you know, you're going to find 20 books with the word close in the title. Right. Close, 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 um, close early, close often, always be closing. Secrets of closing the sale. I mean, everything is closing. I defy anybody to show me the book that says how to open the sale. You are listening to a business podcast network original. Podcasting is the fastest growing content marketing opportunity, which is untapped. We can help you craft your audio strategy and help leverage the wide reach and easy streaming capability that the smartphone penetration provides. It is easy, it is powerful and personal. 
talk to us to find out how podcasting can help you build your brand and reach out to your targets like never before. Write to us at bpn at bizcast.in that is bpn at b-i-z-c-a-s-t dot i-n Business Podcast Network Podcasts End to End Welcome back. I'm Shubhanjan Sarkar, your host for Bits About Books and founder of Pitchlink, the buyer-seller engagement platform. Let's dive right back into the episode where we left it. Let's let's move to the crux of the book, this, this 41 tactics that you want to talk about. And I, I will let you pick. Uh, okay, sure. Um, I'm going to start with my uh, my personal favorite because I think it's something that is uh, missed in almost all sales books. And that is that um, when they say no, your problem may not be closing; it may be opening. Mm. And what I mean by that, of course, if you go to the you go to the uh, bookstore or go online and look up sales books, you're going to find you know you're going to find 20 books with the word close in the title, right? Close, close, close. Um, close early, close often. Always be closing. Secrets of closing the sale. I mean, everything is closing. I defy anybody to show me the book that says how to open the sale. The key to opening the sale. They they kind of act as if closing is the most important part of the selling process. And it's actually the smallest part and it's the final part. I mean, to suggest that closing is the most important part of of selling is to suggest that putting is the most important part of golf. (laughs) As if driving the ball 250 yards and then being able to hit a five iron another 200 yards and then chipping onto the green, as if all of those steps don't matter. Right. And no, it's just putting. No, it's not just putting. So opening the sale is a central piece. So a lot of times if and so what we're suggesting is if you're a salesperson or you have anything that you're trying to you know sell for a living um, and you're hearing no, 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 no. And you're getting nothing but no's. You got to take a step back and say, well, wait a second. Have I connected with this person? Have I bonded with them? Do they know, like and trust me? Because as Bob Berg, our good friend, says, all things being equal, people will do business with people they know, like, and trust. So if people are rejecting your message, um, or rejecting your product or service, it may be simply that they don't know, like, or trust you yet. That goes back to the opening of the sale. Getting, you know, getting somebody to know, like, and trust you means that you don't start out with, hey, it's good to meet you and everything. Let me show you my product. You know, here are the seven key features and here are the benefits. And and you just suddenly start spewing all of this product information. No, getting people to know, like, and trust you starts with, before I even talk about my product, I want to get, I want to get to know you a bit. And I want to make sure that what we have to offer is going to be a value to you. Because if it isn't, there's no sense to me even doing my sales presentation. Well, that's the beginning. That's an opening of a sale. And it, it frames the entire process. There's other things, of course, you know. Uh, in the old world, we used to be able to say, you know, do you shake hands well? <laughs> now I guess it's yeah. do, do you do you fist bump well? Um, yeah. You know, do you smile? Do you do you make the you know the, the the comment about the office or talk about the you know the Marlin that's hanging behind the desk? All that stuff is part of opening a sale. And unless people are good at that, then closing becomes very difficult. But if you are good at opening the sale, then closing becomes the natural smallest step of the process and sometimes can be the quickest part of it. This is very interesting, Richard, because just yesterday I was on a webinar and I spoke literally about this, that <laughs> opening is the most difficult thing in the sales process. It is not only more important, uh, but it's the most difficult thing because that's where you make the mistake of, as you said, pitching too early, judging too early, not giving enough time, not building the trust and so on and so forth. And the other thing that I I, I am on record saying and and <laughs> I, I feel the temptation of repeating that for you is that I said that in the history of sales, no salesperson has ever closed a deal. Every deal has been closed by the buyer. If he, if mm. he didn't sign, no deal is closed. So don't be in this illusion that you're going and closing anything. You, you can give all the ammunition, you can give all the information, you can give all the logic, all the advice, but it's closed only when the buyer closes it. Period. So I totally, totally agree with you on this. And, and this is a great one. Andrea, which is your favorite? So my favorite is uh, don't take no personally. Hmm. 
Of course. And uh, this is a a big one. Again, it's one of those mindset things. Hmm. And uh, I think, again, all salespeople like, uh, I, well, I won't say all, a tremendous number of salespeople get into sales because they're people people. And often they're people pleasers. And they are, um, they tend to like and look for that validation, sometimes too much. And depending on if you are, have your own business, you might be looking for validation simply in your product, your idea, because it's yours. It literally is you. You are selling yourself. I mean, that's the situation that we find ourselves in. So you can take no even more personally that way. But even so, even if you're selling uh, for a company, you chose that company. You're, you're, you're representing, you're the representative of that product. And so there is this attachment that I think people feel and it becomes personal. And so really the strategy, and we have a little key takeaway for every one of our strategies, but the, the mindset shift that has to happen is that no is really all about the other person, their preference, their um, you know, their belief system, their desires, all of it. And it has nothing to do with you. Even if it happens to be about you, it is still nothing to do with you. And Richard uses, we have a story in the book about, about ice cream, about how when uh, you walk into a 31 flavors ice cream store and you ask for the butter pecan ice cream, that the vanilla doesn't freak out and say, I can't believe <laughs> that the, that that person didn't choose me. And because the very next person may walk in and choose vanilla or chocolate or some other flavor, and it has everything to do with that customer. So when you look at that, when you frame it that way, it just enables you, I think, to have that, that more of that freedom. And I think that's what salespeople need is to have that. And when I say freedom, I mean freedom from that stress and pressure yeah. of what does this mean about me? Because when we make it about ourselves, that's when we get that stress. And that's sure. when we feel we, it's 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 certainly um, and I'll and I'll just contradict this with one one other thing, which is we also have we open the book with take responsibility. I think that's the first strategy in the book is take responsibility. It's the first or second. So we always want to take responsibility for the no and to look at what could we have done better. But it doesn't mean that that's very different from taking it personally. Yeah, I mean, absolutely, absolutely. That no can be simply. In in fact, I mean, I, I believe, and 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 maybe you would agree that getting a no quickly is also a great thing, because because you can move on, instead of Shubhanjan trying to sell something to Richard. Hey, you know what, Shubhanjan, why don't we talk after two weeks? You know, and then after two weeks, I follow up diligently, and he says, "Okay, maybe I'm in the in, in the Bahamas now. Four weeks from now, he's not able to tell me no because he likes me, he knows me, and and he say, I mean, how can I tell this guy no? But it's it's better if he tells me, you know what, I'm not I'm not buying now, but yeah, so right. so absolutely, right. And and let me tell you a quick story about about that. Um, you know, we when we wrote Go for No and we launched our business, we had to go out and sell." you know, our speeches and the books, just like anybody else. And, you know, still do. Yeah, still, <laughs> still do. And, you know, we had to call, we had to call, we had to call on, mm -hmm. um, you know, on prospects. And we had read so many traditional sales books that we were misled into believing that the goal of a sales interaction, that what you should try to do is try to get people on the yes train, get them saying yes. If you can get the prospect to say yes, 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 Yes. Then when you finally ask for the order, they'll be so used to saying yes, they'll just say yes. Well, that was complete nonsense for one thing, but it also wasted an enormous amount of time. So if you can picture, um, and Andrea was the uh, initial marketer of the two of us and uh, really does most of the marketing today as well. Um, you know, it, she would get on the phone and, and like, like a lot of salespeople, Hey, how are you doing today? It's a great day, isn't it? Boy, how's the weather there in Dallas? Yeah, that must be really beautiful. You know, so you really, so you would love to increase your sales at your company, wouldn't you? And wouldn't it be great if we could provide a product and somebody could provide a product and a service that gave you a 7% return on your investment? And of course, these are all questions designed to get people saying yes, 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 yes to, right? Well, then we come down to the importance. So now, so now we're two minutes in. And we're getting them on the yes train. 
And they're saying, yes, yes, yes. And now the three big important questions come. One, do you have meetings and conferences? Two, do you bring in speakers from the outside to speak at the meetings and conferences? And three, do you have a budget to pay your speakers? Because I have to tell you, if the answer to those aren't yes, 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 then all of the other stuff was a complete total waste of time. So we changed the selling process and Andrea would get on the phone and she would say, hey, you know, I'm Andrea Waltz. I run a company. I just want to ask you a couple of quick questions. One, do you have meetings and conferences? They go, no. They go, okay, great. Thanks. Click, right? That would be a great no, because trying to belabor that thing, trying to, trying to, you know, lengthen that conversation is, is just deluding yourself into thinking that there's going to be a yes at the end of it. And then she'd ask the second question and the third question. And if it was yes, 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 she'd say, great. Let me tell you what we have to offer that we think might be great for your next conference. Then she'd go into the sales presentation. Um, so disqualifying people yeah. is as important as qualifying people. And a lot of people think that qualifying is getting them to say yes. If I can get them to say yes, they're qualified. <laughs> no, no, that's not true at all. It is such a great story because the, the word disqualify, I think, puts you sort of in a in a tangent. I, I think you are qualifying either way. You're qualifying it for a no or mm -hmm. you're qualifying, qualifying it for a for a conversation which will go forward, right? right. Uh, very interesting. So the other one I want to talk to you about is about trust, right? Mm -hmm. um, so there are two points, uh, Richard, I, I want to ask and put it in upfront so that you can sort of see if, if that blends into your, your, your thought. Sure. See, earlier days, I mean, when we were selling, when we were young, we typically were selling possibly in the same town we grew up in, right? We were selling possibly to friends we went to college with and, and, and people who knew us or we were coaching each other's children and so on and so forth. So trust was built in the social setting. If not, you still had multiple touch points through which you actually developed that trust. And then when you were talking and you also had the trusted uh, source of information, let's not forget that there was no internet. So you are asking me, hey, you went to that or I am coming and telling, you know, I went to that company and this is what they're doing and so on and so forth, right? Today, in this digital first uh, sales environment, that is a, is a very difficult thing to, to, to build. I mean, you, just because I had a nice conversation with you doesn't mean that you start trusting. I mean, if I assume that, that will be quite, mm -hmm. uh, quite uh, naive, right? So right. my question is also, as you talk about building trust, that you, you must be trusted, do, do see if you can sort of shed some light on this part. How do you actually go about doing it? Right. Well, first off, I just want to um, um, comment on your observation, which is completely true. If you go back, if you go back thousands of years, <laughs> right, and you had small tribes, small groups of people, Anybody who was going to do anything else for someone else in, in the tribe was already known, right? And and as you as you move along, and, and I think we've all seen this in movies, right? We've seen the scene in a movie. It's usually like a gangster movie, and somebody's you know saying saying uh you know I, I'm going to sell you this gun, and then the other person goes like you know it better work because if it doesn't, I know where to find you, right? Well, that suggests <laughs> exactly geography. Yeah, yeah. That yeah. suggests geography. And yeah. so when we were close to people in the same town, people had to be um, trusted because they knew there was an actual physical price to be paid if they did something wrong, yeah. um, if at least you know an emotional or maybe financial price. Now you're right. We are living in an entirely different world. And so the question is, since we don't have the geography in order to work in our advantage, we have to use frequency. We have to substitute geography for frequency. Yeah. We all become thing, used to things and that we become to like them over time. The first time we tasted beer, we didn't like it. The first time um, we tasted you know, asparagus or spinach, we didn't like it. First time maybe we saw a movie, we were like, and, but, but the more we see something, the more we get involved with it, the more connected we become to it. And so even though we have the distance of having to do things now um, over Zoom at maybe you know a thousand miles away or ten thousand miles away, we still have the the capacity to create frequency, and people will begin to know you 
and then eventually like you. And then that builds the trust. You know, you, there's nothing you can say in a first meeting to, to make someone trust you. Right. Trust me. Um, just like just, just like dating. Yeah. I mean, just like dating. You know, Andrea yeah. and I, you know, we're getting, you know, first off, we're getting to know each other and then we're getting to like each other. And then eventually over time, trust is built. Yeah. Trust is built over time and it can be destroyed very quickly. So when a salesperson makes a promise and then they don't deliver on it, all of that building of the trust goes away and you start over from scratch because now the person doesn't know if they can trust you anymore. And so no like and trust is super critical. Frequency is the number one thing. And the second thing is delivering on your promises, delivering on your promises, no matter how big or how small. If I, you know, if I'm a salesperson and I say, hey, I'm going to fax you that quote by nine o'clock tomorrow morning. 901 is not good enough. Okay. Nine o'clock is nine o'clock or before. And if you start thinking in terms of delivering on every promise you make, no matter how small, eventually that builds trust over time. That's what we have to do in the world in which we're selling today. And I just want to add to this. Please. So Richard is a expert and started his uh, his career in clothing. And so he knows this. You know, clothing back in the day used to signal like uh, what kind of person you were. So the king always wore these beautiful robes and royalty always has the beautiful colors. And, the, and so it was very obvious. And then you could look at really anybody and look at their clothing and see if they're successful. Um, a trapper who goes out and hunts and foxes and is covered in these things. And you go like, wow, this person really knows what he's doing. I should buy his um, furs from him. And so I think in the in the digital world, and this is where this trust thing, and I love the question, this is so off the rails from our book, but this is what I have noticed. I think this is why branding in social media is so important. We don't have the geography anymore. And so the equivalent to what do what is what does somebody look like? What are they dressed like? How can I discern who this person is? Is I go to see their digital footprint. And so we go to their LinkedIn page and see their photo and see their, their credentials. If they don't have a LinkedIn page or if they're not active or if they have no social media, then we become suspicious. I know I do. Mm. You get suspicious. Like, okay, this person says they do this, this and this. And yet they're not, they don't have a presence. Where are they? And so that's. That's what's making, I think, selling in 2023 so interesting is we're all finding that being online is part of building that trust. It's such a great, great, uh, great answer. And not, not as an answer, but I think I think these are more, I mean, for the lack of a better word right now, a philosophical question about sales that we need to discuss more. Mm. Uh, and, and we don't discuss these things enough. We, we are so caught up in delivering to the inbox and which new tool. I mean, I, I, I run a SaaS company. I know it's very important for me, but but that's not what is important for my customer, you know, I mean, unfortunately. Right. <laughs> okay, the final one, I, 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 I know you have answered this in a bit uh, uh, already, but let, let's, let's talk about this. No is not never. So you, you talk about that. So I, I would li like you to elaborate on that idea as well. Yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's it's such a it's such a uh, cornerstone of the go for no philosophy, and that is that this idea that no doesn't mean never, um, no means not yet, and and sometimes it does. Yeah. Uh, sometimes no is never, and if you can discern that, and if mm. you can have the courage to ask a question to give you that information, great. Then you can. Um, not contact that person. And we want to always respect what people are saying. We also know that if, if you've been selling for, for just a few hours, <laughs> you know that you get so many no's that it couldn't possibly be the case, that it's statistically impossible that no is always never because no one would then ever sell anything. No one would ever make progress right. with anyone. And so oftentimes it is a factor of they you they don't know who you are. They haven't you haven't built trust. You haven't necessarily listened to what they're saying. Um, they they have a timing issue. There are so many. We all know there's so many reasons for the hesitation. 
a big one in B2B. It's just not a priority. The pain is not great enough, as they say, right? The the desire to change is not is not there yet. And then once the desire is, uh, once something happens, once there's a fire they need to put out, then of course you want to be the person that they call and go like, okay, we're ready. And so again, to Richard's point, that frequency and that willingness to follow up, stay engaged with those people. Because when it does finally change, when there is finally the pain becomes great enough and they finally say, okay, we can no longer tolerate what we're dealing with now. We need the salesperson's help. Who are they going to go to? Are they just going to jump on Google and start doing random searches or will they seek you out? And that's the biggest challenge for salespeople. And that's why we have to stay connected and stay engaged with that With that, no. Right. When, when we first wrote Go For No, we sent out 500 copies of the book to um, all different companies, to the vice president of sales and the, you know, the um, VP training, the VP of training. And uh, we got a letter back from, from a company and the letter, I, I wish I'd kept it. I, I don't know. know. I don't know if we didn't keep the letter, but uh, it said, um, we received your book. Your book is f- filled with ideas that are antithetical to our corporate mission. Um, we, we, we don't understand why you even sent it to us. And please don't ever contact us again. There is no chance that we will ever do business with you or your company. Uh, and then it's signed by the vice president. And you know, so we were like, wow, you know, better stay away from those people. Seven years later, we're doing business with them. <laughs> I mean, did it, it now? And we didn't pursue them as hard as we should have. But eventually in the marketplace, somebody else in that company got a call of the book and said, hey, this is great. You know, so, you know, if we write off entire companies, we write off people and we think that because they said no to us once that they're never going to buy from us, as Andrea said, going to be a pretty short career. You know, you're going to end up with a very, very small list of of companies to sell to because um, very rarely does anybody ever say yes on the very first call. It's pretty rare unless you're selling a very inexpensive item. Yeah. Um, people don't say yes on the first call anymore. Absolutely, it's just just such a great story. And and to Andrea's point, I I so agree with this because somebody when they're saying no, see, three percent people, like you said, if there is a fire, three percent people have fire, and they are going to buy today. So those guys are there to do a deal, whatever it is. The balance ninety seven percent are not buying because they're not buying today. They may be buying next month, next quarter, next <laughs> next year. That's but right. that's where. All that you said makes so much sense. I mean, yeah. you you have to do that, right? We had a door-to-door sales guy close us because literally 20 minutes before he knocked on the door, I was outside looking at this tree that we had and wasps were flying everywhere. And I was so, I was freaking out and they're they're all <laughs> over the place. And I'm thinking, our pest control people must not be doing a good job because this is really bad. Then he knocks on the door and I was like, all right, I'm open-minded. Tell me, give me your spiel. I, I'll listen. I signed up. And Richard's like, we have a pest control company. You, um, you know, why, why did you do that? He, she, he goes, you're, you're just, you're just, you fall for all, all good salespeople. Cause I do love a good sales presentation. I admit. And this guy was really good, but also the timing. It was just a perfect timing. Yeah, right. Yeah, and every company, every company does this, you know, um, uh, we're happy with our current supplier. Hmm. Um, yeah, but you were also probably happy with the supplier before your current supplier became your current supplier. And I would like to be your f- supplier in the future. So the idea that someone has a is that they're happy with their current supplier and that they're never going to change is ridiculous. Absolutely. Absolutely. Let, let's move to the motivation. That, that's a great coinage, by the way. Motivation. <laughs> I, I love motivation. it. I, I really love it. Let, let, let's talk about that. I know you got to show up. You got to show up. I, in fact, I'm, I must tell you one story before you tell me mm-hmm. about it. I have a friend who, who used to be with IBM. I mean, um, he's no, no, he's retired. And, and he was one of the top salesmen there, right? He was Indian who went to US and he started living, working for IBM. And I said, how how did you become the top guy? He said, Shubhani will not believe how many times I'll turn up when nobody else will. This is like I'm selling a $100,000 box. My competition will just not turn up. Hmm. I was just the guy who showed up. That's it. I mean, it helped that I was selling IBM, but that's it. So please talk about it. 
I love it. Well, you know, I, first of all, everybody needs to be motivated daily. Um, as Zig Ziglar said, motivation is like bathing. It helps if you do it every day. And so our version is just motivation. And, and I think Richard used the word earlier, which is courage Mm. and that facing no and, and intentionally increasing the number of times you hear no. In other words, making a concerted effort to show up to go outside your comfort zone, to make the asks that are uncomfortable. And that could be in any stage of the sales process, but to ask those hard questions, uh, those go for no type questions requires courage, no doubt. And so there's a couple of good stories in there. Um, uh, one about <laughs> Richard getting punched in the stomach. <laughs> you can tell that if you want. <laughs> but the, but the point of that story is that is that it is so important to show up and that even this what seems to be the scariest thing that could ever happen to you once you experiencing it experience it you you just move forward yeah and it all comes down to this definition of courage you know a lot of people think a lot of people think courage is fearlessness and it's not we've had people come up to us after speaking engagements and say oh i wish i was fearless like you guys well oh wait a second we're not fearless um, of course, we have fears. Of course, you know, failure and rejection impacted us or impacts us still. Because if it didn't, we would have never thought to write the book. We understand that it can be something that's a hurdle that people have to jump over. And so, you know, in in my particular case, I happen to think that um, courage, even though it may not require that you pull out a sword and go to battle with the customer, still to dial the phone, to get on the phone, to to not hang up just because they said, you know, no one time or they, they gave you one objection and to be able to press for the reason. All of those things require a certain amount of courage. There's a certain amount of overcoming your fear of failure and rejection. And so we think courage is really, um, it's it's central. Um, somebody even said courage is the first, not, not, first virtue, the first virtue. You know, there's a actual saying out that courage is the first virtue. I think that might have been Socrates. Yeah, might have been Socrates. I mean, but it's but it's true. Everything starts with having the courage to do something. I asked Andrea to marry me every day for over a year, over 400 times in all. And people hear the story and they don't believe it, but it's completely true. And in the beginning, it took a tremendous amount of courage to even get the words out. To even, you know, to even just say, hey, will you marry me? I was like, oh, but when she finally said yes, it wasn't even a great proposal. I just said, are you going to marry me or what? (laughs) And she went, yeah, let's do it. (laughs) I I mean, so so the point is, it starts with courage. And if you do something often enough and long enough, okay, then then the word no loses its power over you and it doesn't require quite as much courage. So um, we think courage is really central. Wonderful. Bits About Books is brought to you by Pitchlink, the buyer-seller engagement platform. Pitchlink makes buying easy by enabling high-quality engagement between buyers and sellers through its presentation and discussion modules. Sellers create customized sales narratives using sales collaterals and personal videos and reach out to prospects through a non-intrusive buyer-qualified engagement. Pitchlink requires no installation or download and holds the entire repository of sales collaterals and buyer-seller conversations. Talk to us to know more about how you can engage with customers without intrusion. Call us on 99021-631-32. We'll wrap up with the the final point, which is your 21-day challenge. So let's talk about that a bit. Yeah, I I love doing these. I'm actually going to start one in just a couple of weeks here. And that is, uh, uh, we created a workbook actually that's available on Amazon. It's something that anybody can pick up and 21 days, see how many no's you can get in a variety of categories. And it's a, it's a really fun chart to go through, but, um, really the, the, live coaching that I do, we meet every seven days during that challenge. And we talk about what's going on for people and how was their week. And it just forces people to, instead of go for yes, think about how many no's you can collect, set a, set a goal for the number of no's you're going to collect. And uh, interesting things happen with people. Um, all kinds of epiphanies. People realize what's holding them back. They realize it's not... Um, 
that some of their their goals require them to really make bigger asks than they're making now. And so they have all kinds of learnings, which is just awesome. Wonderful. Anything you would like to add to what we discussed already? Gosh, what else do we have to say about when they say no? Um, you know, I guess I would just add that, like Richard said, we are not uh, fearless. We are not, we, we don't, we are not the best people at handling rejection ourselves that we teach this stuff because we have a passion and a mission because we know that when you have the courage to ask, amazing things can happen. Uh, and we have to push ourselves out of our comfort zone every day to do it. Um, so we just happen to be experts on the topic, uh, not coming on from high, like, oh, it's so easy. Um, we just know that the benefits are there and it's much better to ask and risk getting a no than it is to tell yourself no. Yeah. And I'll just, and I'll just wrap with, um, everybody loves the sound of the word. Yes. I mean, it's so powerful. It's so positive, right? Um, it's where we make the money. It's where we get what we want. And then there's the word no. And for most people, no is negative and draining. Um, but the question that we would ask is, what if everybody's wrong? What if, what if no is actually the most empowering word in the world? What if your ability to hear the word no and get past it was the singular thing that was going to give you everything that you wanted? Um, in that regard, if you think that way, then no becomes the most positive word. It becomes the thing that empowers you because when you get your power over it, it stops having power over you. Andrea, Richard, thank you so much for joining me and, and taking time to talk about your new book. I'm really glad that you made it and thank you again. Thank you for having us. You're Super welcome. Super interesting discussion. That was a great interview. Yes. Thanks for having us. We have a fantastic lineup over the next couple of episodes with great conversations on breakthrough books. Subscribe in your favorite podcast app so you do not miss a single episode. Thanks for listening. Thank you for being with us today on Bits About Books, where we talk to authors about breakthrough books on sales, marketing, and business. We hope this conversation helped inform and motivate as we all navigate a rapidly changing business environment. For us, these are enlightening conversations enriched with knowledge and expertise. We encourage you to go out and buy the book to learn firsthand and implement some of the great ideas we discussed today. We hope to have you with us again in the next exciting episode of Bits About Books. If you liked what you heard, Subscribe to the show in your favorite podcast platforms like iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts from and give us a rating while you are at it. This BizCast original podcast is produced for PitchLink, the next generation buyer-seller engagement platform, where the mission is to make buying easy. Hosted by Subhanjan Sarkar and produced by Rajiv Aditya. See you next time and have a wonderful day.